This is Disclosure Now, a show where we expose the truths that are nefariously hidden from humanity. Today's guest is the founder of Dark Our Paranormal Michael Rosa. Michael is an independent researcher of paranormal phenomenon who recently released a documentary pertaining to what is colloquially known as the Montauk Project. down there what we would know today like sort of like a hadron collider in order to create the time space continuum disruption that they needed to connect with other dimensions so this is battery 216 and this is the first place i ever ventured into the base you can't see his face, it's like the Matrix or something, like it's just like, like a peach blur, like they blurred out his face. And there's other people there who were involved in, in his life and his time travel projects. All time coexists and it's possible to go from point A to point B. But these groups work together very closely, especially recently and especially on projects such as Montauk. All right, so welcome to Disclosure Now. Uh, we are here with Michael from Dark Hour Paranormal. Um, it's a pleasure to have him. Uh, this documentary that uh, he made regarding Montauk is um, hugely powerful, covers a lot of ground, a lot of territory that hasn't been really covered yet, and I think also brings forth a fair amount of solid evidence, despite the fact that people try to claim that there isn't any evidence. So, in that regard, I can't thank you enough, Michael. And uh, yeah, welcome to the show. Why don't you give your, give uh, the viewers a little introduction to who you are and what you do? Thank you very much, Arkeem. That was very endearing, and I appreciate those kind words coming out. Um, the documentary was something that I put a lot of time into in respect to the vision. Uh, initially, uh, I had released another documentary on the Montauk Project called The Montauk Enigma. It was three years ago now. But it was more uh, focused on what I was finding interesting about the project and going out to Camp Hero for the first time uh, with Brian Minnick and Michael Colantonio. And that was, again, more of a personal journey, even though I did touch upon some things that were within the story. I felt that uh, standing back, there was more of an underwhelming feeling coming from that side of creativity. So my initial vision for the one that we've just released, Lost Souls of Montauk, was to actually have some of these people involved that really were there. And it's very difficult, obviously, to get some of the survivors to talk. I mean, there's a comfortability level. There's this concern about uh, becoming stigma, you know, within their own societies, within their families, within their workplace, if we're going to talk about this publicly. So it, t it takes a, an enormous amount of bravery to have someone sit down and talk to you at length the way that we see within the documentary. Uh, myself, little background, I started researching esoterics back in 1991, 92. Uh, I was very much influenced by Unsolved Mysteries, you know, some of Carl Sagan stuff, regardless of what we know about him today. Um, this was the platform that you would go to find this type of information outside of a library. You know, obviously we didn't have internet the way that we do today, so we couldn't just look things up. Around 2002, I stumbled across a page that was uh, from an article that Al Balik had written at some point. And this sort of described the Philadelphia experiment and then, you know, very quickly worked its way into Phoenix 1, 2, and 3. And I was absolutely fascinated. And at the same time, I felt some sort of familiarity with this particular story. Now, of course, I had researched many other things prior to this. I had not had that same connection innately and i didn't understand why but you know as it was during that time i continued researching uh forward and this sort of took a back burner but it kept popping up as the years went on um i eventually many years later realized that i did have a definitive connection to montauk and once i sort of cleared out for myself to the best of my ability what that connection was it allowed me to move forward to speak to people like yourself james rink alondra markman 
and many of the other purported people who had been involved in that project one way or another. Now, I won't tell you that we didn't start with some of the first generation survivors. We did. Um, I mean, I haven't spoken to Stuart Swordlow, you know, for a specific reason, but obviously he's part of that generation. And there were others. And still there are people, believe it or not, in their well advanced years coming to me, even after seeing this documentary claiming, yes, I was part of this project. For years, I had, you know, dealt with certain things. Uh, I had many questions. And, you know, maybe this documentary is offering a different perspective, which is actually perhaps answering some of those questions for even the first generation survivors. Yes, I think you've done a great job with that. Um, I am kind of uh, interested, side note, and if you're not comfortable uh, going into it more, that's fine. But uh, I have noticed when it comes to the Montauk boys um, and all of us coming forward right now, um, Stuart Swordlow seems to be silent. Um, mm -hmm. We kind of have a camaraderie that we're forming, us Montauk survivors. We're all talking, forming friendships and trying to form solid testimony in order to maybe bring this forth into in court eventually. And I'm just kind of curious where this sort of separation between us and Stuart Swordlow might come from and what your maybe what some of your reason is for not talking to him. Again, if you're not comfortable going in too much detail into that, I totally understand. But if you are willing to answer the question, I'm definitely curious. Absolutely, man. Not a problem. Um, you know, Stuart has been a very polarizing figure uh, from the moment that he came out talking about being a Montauk boy. And, you know, we've sort of dealt with that as time has gone on the best that we could with Grace, of course. Um, I can't tell you exactly who told me this, but I I'll tell you that there is a very original source who had exclaimed to me at one point that he believed Stuart Swordlow's wife might actually be one of his handlers. And he had very specific details to support that theory, which, you know, within that expression, I, I had to say, well, there, there might be something there. So it is possible that within that dynamic, if that indeed is the case, there is some sort of stifling on Stuart's part. Now, I mean, the guy is completely fractured still. You know, to whatever end and from whatever origin, you know, we can obviously see this in the way that he's speaking sometimes, maybe his mannerisms, the decisions that he's made in the past. And though we can't fault him for that, if he certainly had been through some sort of uh, trauma, we can say that this is the presentation moving forward. And unfortunately, today, I feel personally that Stuart is more in line with his own interests and in what he can capitalize when it comes to this particular story, which, again, I, I don't necessarily fault him for, but it does truncate some of the other survivors and their stories and the significance of this camaraderie that we have when you hold a disposition such as that. I, I mean, it's very unfortunate, um, and I wish that things were different with, with Stuart. But, you know, even when Christopher Garantano had interviewed him for his movies, um, there was a whole conflict that occurred because he had asked, you know, some very sensitive questions, but they were questions that probably needed to be asked in order for him to give us clarification and believability even further than what he's already proposed. So again, unfortunately, you know, Stuart is a very polarizing figure, you know, obviously not to the point of maybe Andy Perro or Andrew, you know, Bajiago, which is actually on the, you know, more lamer side of that sort of thing. I've talked to Andrew. He's a very very nice guy, very intelligent, and I, I absolutely hold some sort of belief in respect to the narrative that he provides. But yeah, going back to Stuart, it's um, I think for now it's a lost cause. I don't think he's going to be uh, spearheading anything in terms of um, revelation when it comes to the story. I think he's he's done. Yeah, I, I, I want to go ahead. Uh, just just real quick, I want to say that I I did read his book. Um, I think it's thirty eight cubed or some sort of number cubed. Um, I got maybe halfway through it. It's very dark. It's very hard to finish. I it, I, mm -hmm. I kind of put it down, but I do think he has some some testimony. And I you know we we all kind of all of us Montauk survivors agree he was there. Um, but I do think um, uh, he might have been a programmer and. And there might be some sort of fear that he has to talk to us because of guilt and stuff like that. And I just want to, on the record, say that all of us who he might have had negative dealings with, we all 
I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but if he's willing to come forward, we would forgive him and we we welcome him. But at the same time, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. He seems to have a sort of disposition where, unfortunately, that's probably not going to happen, at least not any time in the near future. Uh, Brian, I, I pass the microphone to you. Oh, yeah, thanks, Arkeem. You know, I mean, you, you both hey, you are, are speaking to um, Stuart Serlove and uh, Andrew Baziago. And, you know, I, I know a lot of people out there, especially those just tuning in and, and learning about secret space programs and the Montauk Project are like, where's the proof? Where's the proof? You know, I believe I've seen there's footage floating around out there of what looks like Stuart uh, shaking the hand of an alien gray, a gray alien who's like mm -hmm. almost as, as tall as he is. And then, you know, speaking to Andrew Baziago, there's apparently that photographic evidence of him as a child during Project Pegasus back in time at the Gettysburg Address wearing what looked like a, a oversized shoes and a jacket that were given to him on site by locals. I think the most damning evidence for the fact that the Montauk Project or Project Phoenix, as it were, uh, definitely existed is the fact that um, Michael was able to prove with his documentary that they say there's no underground facility to the, like any underground infrastructure to the point where it's kind of delusional. Like sometimes you need a basement for it doesn't even make sense. Right. Like and, and then in the documentary also just documenting the fact that clearly there's an underground infrastructure so clearly they're lying about something and then also um uh the fbi gentleman's uh what's his name again um uh john de souza john de souza yes uh, it's a name that i need to make sure to remember um he really gave some damning testimony too as far as you know the reality of the montauk project and that there's really something to this i mean it, it probably isn't really the smoking gun that a lot of people would want as far as just this guy coming forward and giving some credence to it that, you know, has kind of some of the backing to, to be able to say something like that. But um, yeah, there's just, there's just a whole lot of what I would call evidence in the documentary. And I think you paired that with our testimony, which of course is a little more hard to verify, but I think you mm -hmm. paired the evidence with, with our testimony quite well. And I think we all can thank you for that. This is really a, a great, um, uh, just expose on what happened there. And to the viewers who uh, stumbled upon this interview, I highly recommend you get to his channel, Dark Hour Paranormal. You subscribe. He has all sorts of great content. And of course, check out the documentary. It's got, uh, I think it's like 12,000 views now on climbing, and we definitely want it to get more. Um, it, it needs to be seen by as many as people as possible. All right, very much. Thank you for that. I mean, you know, a quick note on the underground. I mean, I didn't show... The blueprints that that Brian has brought to me uh, within the documentary, uh, we're going to save that for a later presentation because it's much more involved than perhaps even the documentary I put together here uh, could really encompass. Now, you know, one of the things that we've noted in many cases is that on these blueprints, everything is accurate above ground, but there's no mention or illustration or architecture of any kind when it comes to talking about an underground or a basement or utilidor tunnels or sewer systems, these things obviously have to happen or be created in a compound like Camp Hero if you're housing thousands of soldiers, which they did, you know, for generations. Every great war uh, saw some sort of affect when it came to Camp Hero and their involvement. Now, just taking the Sage Radar Tower alone, you know, there were a handful of these built throughout the world. Right now in Montauk, that is the last standing one. I think the one prior to that had fallen or been raised was in France. But the one in Montauk, that FPS uh, and 30 radar, that's that's the last one standing in the world. Now, in every single one of these Sage radars, they were all built by the same company. Uh, I forget the name of it. Brian, of course, could probably you know narrate that a little bit better. But regardless, they had to, for a structural reason, be very deep underground, probably within three or four levels. Otherwise, they would have just toppled over. Now, one of the things that people always bring up is, you know, Montauk is is a lot of sand, you know, and, and yeah, there's granite, but, you know, maybe it's really deep down. Well, through different LIDAR scannings that have been done over the years, we realize that it's not as far down as we thought. And if that's the case, then that would support some sort of integrity in respect to structures and tunnels and labs being built underground. When John D'Souza mentions that he never heard if the tunnels were underground, it might seem almost 
a moot statement. But if you think about it, there have been many different facilities that are either built within mountains or, you know, built on top of the ground disguised as something else. I mean, I think S4 at one point was one of those facilities. I don't know if it still stands the same way today, but, you know, they're covert operations and they're not guided by government officials that we've elected. These are people internally that are so far up the echelon that, you know, it, it, we probably wouldn't ever even have access to having some sort of dialogue with these people if we could even find out who they were. Something, so, again, going and, something that people often say when it comes to, um, you know, MK Ultra is that, well, the Congress went in and shut it down. Right. So obviously it stopped because there was a vote in Congress where they said they found out that this mind control project was going on and they said, we're not going to give this any, any, any more money. They basically said no. But what never happened is nobody went in with guns or w with some sort of authority and arrested the people responsible or shut down the programs. And from what we've seen with the very um, damning evidence that the CIA uh, trafficked uh, cocaine to uh, fund the Contras, um, they really don't need uh, taxpayer funding in order to um, get money to do what they want to do. They'll find a way. So um, really, there that's another thing that I think is direct evidence that these pro there's no reason to think these programs ever got shut down because there is no evidence of them getting shut down. Um, Congress cutting off funding to something is very different than it getting rid of the infrastructure and the conditions that allowed it to happen in the first place. I thought I just thought that was you very know, worthwhile to mention. No, absolutely. And I think, you know, if, if you look back into the testimonies from Preston, Al, and Duncan, you will find a parallel that you're mentioning here, wherein, you know, MK Ultra, you know, obviously was around a very similar time just before it was a development that eventually moved into what we understood as the Montauk project. And, you know, it was purported that once they had figured out, because they were already playing with frequencies back then empirically, they did figure it out um, what band it was. It was 430 something. I forget off the top of my head, but they had pinpointed this. And when they brought it to Congress, they said, hey, look what we can do. Let's go into scientific endeavors with this. And Congress said, well, if you can do that to other people indiscriminately, you could probably do it to us without us knowing. So and boop, that's when they pulled the funding for them. And that was the motivation for them to bring it to the Air Force and say, well, we want to continue this research. I don't care if we have to weaponize it. We want to continue the research. Are you interested? And of course, the Air Force took on to that. And uh, the rest is history. Yeah. Wonderful. Connecting the dots. See, that, it, it, that is uh, why we are all grateful for you in this community, is that you are <laughs> Thank you. connecting the dots and bringing forth evidence. There are a lot of people that would sit back today and say, you know, nothing more is going to emerge from this story. We're, we're going on, you know, from the uh, inception of this project, you know, 60 years anyway. So obviously, as time goes on, things become more nebulous. But it's a matter of intellectual deduction, in my opinion. It's, it's not a matter of having the smoking gun in hand and having one bit of evidence that proves everything. It's looking outside peripherally pulling in the anecdotal evidence, pulling in the topographical evidence, even going into the demographics of what Montauk is and talking to the people there, and then coming to a conclusion based on an accumulation of what we would consider soft evidence into something much more solid. That's what I think we can offer today. And Brian Minnick is just about finished with a book that he's written on this entire subject. And I have to tell you, the thing reads like a textbook. It's so dense. But there's so much information in there and so much that people will uh, garner in respect to the inquisition of that type of knowledge that I think it's going to be very difficult in years to come for people to ignore this as heavily as they have. They're at least going to be able to sit back and say, OK, well, when I'm connecting certain things here, there definitely is a continuity. So where there's a continuity, there's usually a flow. And within that endeavor and that understanding, well, you get a much bigger picture of what more than likely happened. I would say so. Michael, um, how long or how many years ago did you found the uh, Dark Hour Paranormal podcast? Great question, man. Um, I actually started with the moniker back in 2008. 
uh, there was another gentleman that I was working with at the time, and we decided that we wanted to get into paranormal research, uh, very actively boost on the ground. So that's what we came up with together. And that outfit lasted until about 2011 when I, uh, from two separate entities while filming a television pilot, ended up garnering two non-human entities that followed me home. Again, separate incidents about three months apart, but it, that was terrible and uh, another story in and of itself. When I decided to get back into radio, which I began back in 2004, um, I realized that, you know, around 2017, 18, that radio wasn't as popular or prevalent, you know, within uh, these listening forums that it used to be. So the same individual said, well, you got to get on YouTube. I said, well, I don't know. There's a visceral, com visceral component. Uh, I'm not used to that. He said, yeah, but this is the avenue that we're all going and you need to be there. So I mean, that's you, when I founded the podcast around about end of 2018. I, I wanted to comment on that because when you when you made the jump into radio from radio into podcasting, then around 2018, you know, you, not only did you, I mean, you added a lot of production value. You know, just watching like the uh, the intro um, to your own show, Dark Hour Paranormal, or or the work that you did on the documentary. I mean, the only reason why you know we we've got you just your your blank screen right now is because for the sake of internet, we want this you know, to be a clear interview and we thank you for mm -hmm. that. Um, but, but you really did make a, you made an excellent jump from radio to podcasting. I'd say, because, you know, we, we could learn a, a bit from you and, and up our own production value. So I, I know we're going to question point for of pointers for you. Questions for oh. you. No, thank you, man. I appreciate that. I have to say that um, that type of work, you know, going into the documentaries and filming and so forth, uh, the inspiration was kind of twofold. Um, I'm an audio engineer by trade. Uh, so I figured when I looked at video editing, it, it should be similar to an audio program. I mean, you know, you have your tracks and you have your separations and you can do your breaks and pauses and so forth. Um, but I wasn't sure how to get into that. It just seemed kind of foreign to me. So I ended up linking up with third phase of moon and these guys for all intents and purposes, very much encouraged that I could do this myself. I said, well, I remember the day too. And he says, you know, I, I don't think I can go out and just film an episode. I said, there's two of you, you know, brothers or cousins, I'm sorry, cousins, brothers are twins. So they're always working with each other. So one's, you know, in front of the camera, one's behind the camera. So that, there's two of you. I mean, there's a disadvantage for me here. And I'll never forget. They said, no, we'll show you right now. We're going to go out to a location and I'm going to bring one camera and I'm just going to go out into the, it was a graveyard said, and I'll shoot it from different angles, and this is how you're going to do it going forward. So without further ado, that's exactly what he did, sent it over to me, and I said, well, I guess all I need is a tripod and a little bit of ingenuity, and I guess I can do this myself. And that was really the catalyst for me to, to heavily get into the um, documentaries and you know learning to edit and so forth. Uh, Rich Giordano from Goofon was also there helping me along that way, but it was really those two groups that pushed me and propelled me in that direction and then i realized uh that i could do it so <laughs> and, and you mentioned paranormal experiences was it paranormal experiences of your own before you had the show and that you were consciously aware of i mean i know it sounds like you over the years you've kind of realized that you may have been part of the montauk projects yourself and you know i've heard over and over again it, it, for a lot of people who are attracted to these the subject matter and especially people like yourself are driven to go into it, you know, career wise at a professional level, even, um, mm -hmm. you know, like you look at Tyler Koala with journey to truth as well, who we, we also got had the honor of interviewing and it turned out he was a, a military abductee. It looks like, and it's like, wow, the, the tight, this, there's a lot more in this community that we realize. Oh, absolutely. What well, I'm sorry. What was the, the first question you were going on? So I were you, up it, was it you had consciously remembered paranormal well, experiences of your own that then led you to say, hey, I want to do a, a paranormal podcast or um, you just kind of got into it and fell into it. And then what do you know now you've discovered, hey, wait a second, you know, people are recognizing me from these projects. <laughs> Thank you for that reiteration. I appreciate it. Um, I've always had paranormal experiences since I was very young uh, at a tender age i realized that i was clairvoyant um although i didn't have a word for it i mean i would see spirit the way that people might describe uh in full form of course a lot of shadow figures that have clairaudience 
uh, when I was 12 years old, uh, and, and I, I thank both of my parents, but I really thank my mother for kind of putting the effort forth with my development uh, in terms of spirituality. Uh, she, she had a psychic that she would go to in, intermittently. And she mentioned, you know, I, I started asking questions, you know, deeper questions about, you know, existence and so forth. And she said, you know, would you like to talk to him? Now, as a general rule, as any clairvoyant will tell you, we don't read people under the year of 18. And the reason for that is because there's an impressionability um, that comes about with a certain premonition or, you know, if you're on this same path, you know, we might call it a timeline today. If you make the certain choices that, you know, you would be making, this is the outcome that'll happen. And if you decide to do something different, well, there's disappointment and expectation that come into that. But she made an exception to give me a full reading, not just talk to me, but actually have a reading for me. And so I went and sat with her. And this was a very pivotal point in my life where, I mean, I just started to kind of figure out who I was. I think we generally do that around the time we hit puberty. That's really when we anchor into our body. Uh, otherwise, we're still kind of, you know, filtering in as, you know, we're so young. And, you know, she told me some very general things, but was very specific about others and mentioned that I was very connected to spirit, which, again, I knew, but it was a great confirmation and that I've been here many, many, many times before. And not only have I lived in the past in this timeline, but I'm living in the future as, you know, I think we today is it's more common talk to speak this way. But back then, you know, it was rel revelatory to me. So within that, I started reading a lot more and I got my hands on a book called Embraced by the Light by Betty J. Eady, which to that time and maybe even today is one of the most compelling near death experiences that's ever been documented. Uh, years later, you know, on the podcast, I did have the pleasure of, of uh, interviewing her and, you know, we went into detail about some of that stuff. But I've always been aware of uh, what we would consider to be paranormal activity and just spirit that's around you, you know, at any given point. We all share the same space. It's just divided into vibrational states. And whether you're aware of those states or not is very dependent on many factors within the individual. So, you know, starting this podcast, I, I guess the, the biggest effort for me, or the biggest reason I should say that I decided to go this route is because within my paranormal investigations, I realized that I couldn't do it that way. I couldn't research the paranormal the way that I had been because I was getting myself into dangerous situations. And more importantly, I was putting people around me, including family members, into those dangerous situations with the entities that had followed me home. So is like I a thought- John that, Keel, a, a, a John Keel type phenomenon? <laughs> In a sense, in a sense, yes, there are parallels that we could draw within that. But again, there's always a right way to do something. And maybe that's individualized. Uh, I think there's more evidence for that as, as we go forward. But um, it was a safer way for me to still explore that side of reality uh, and, you know, maintain a certain distance within what I was, you know, allegedly coming into contact with using other methods. So you're, you're trying to mean distance from like a, a, to be like objective and from a journalistic standpoint. And so it didn't become too much where you're becoming intertwined with a phenomenon and you're more trying to report upon it without becoming intertwined with it. There's an element of that, but it was more my uh, caution about how to approach spirit and who might come, what kind of energies I was already attracting. I mean, I'm not for not for nothing. I'm not going to say that I didn't go out into the field looking for the darkest of the dark. I did want to experience that. I wanted to have that tactile experience where I could draw from that memory and compare it to other locations that necessarily had something or didn't necessarily have as, as much negative energy. So I know that consciously there was a part of me that sought that. But when I found it, it was a lot more than I ever realized and, and much more than I was able to handle. Um, I've had three experiences like that within my life, probably within, you know, the 10 years of each other, you know, within a 10 year window. And, you know, yes, there is a, a journalistic side. There's a skeptic side. Uh, you know, you have to stay skeptical. You have to stay within the realm of critical thinking. And that's really just to bring clarity to what's being told or expressed anecdotally or otherwise. I mean, people generally need something to hold on to. It's, it's the nature of the left brain to have that sort of evidence so that you can corroborate it. And yeah, I think I think that's what we've done in that direction, you know, for the majority of the channel, even though, you know, there are times where I'm talking about my connection to Montauk and that's 
as etheric as it gets. I mean, I wasn't a Montauk boy. I wasn't there physically, but I was there. And if you want, I can I can go into that. But nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, Arkeem would think that I, I think that'd be great. I'd, I'd love to hear that. So long story short, and believe me, it's still a little convoluted, but we're, we're figuring more out every day. Um, my energy is the same energy within a soul family that Preston, Duncan, and Al belong to. So they're within my soul family. And there was always a reason that I was drawn to those individuals, even outside of what they were talking about with the project. There was something there that I just couldn't put my finger on. Uh, I spoke with a, a clairvoyant by the name of Michelle Gray, who I met through Elisa Medhus of Channeling Eric. And, you know, we, we got together and uh, there were a couple few sessions that we did that brought out some more answers for me when it came to my connection and involvement. Now, I'm going to say this because I think it's very relevant. She has no idea, even to this day, really what the Montauk Project was. Uh, so she went into this blindly when I'm asking her questions, very specific questions, and she would channel this through with the help of Eric from the other side. Uh, and, and we would, you know, retrieve the information this way. Apparently, I'm some sort of cosmic antenna in the respect that I can put an extension of myself out into the ethers and I can just pick up on anything that's out there readily available within the consciousness grid. And for me, the challenge was to be able to differentiate what was there outside of myself, meaning I didn't have personal experience with it versus what I was actually um, innately, peripherally and directly involved in when it came to certain aspects, including the Montauk project. So I have memories of being in the underground labs in Montauk. I remember seeing the chair. I could draw the room for you. It's never changed in my memory. I could even see specific receivers and probably tell you which ones they were, you know, based on this memory. And it sits in my myself similar to a past life memory where you know that you weren't that same person. But what was happening in Montauk, uh, you know, keeping in mind the scope of this project, not only were extraterrestrials coming and going physically and also sitting in that paranormal highway vibrationally, there were souls and other um, overarching groups of, um, I don't know what you would call them, not necessarily angels, but you know, a lot of people or entities that were interested in the direction that was being taken with this project. So they were sitting on the opposite side as auditors and while they weren't there physically, they were there in a non-physical sense. And this, you know, the people who were running the project knew this somehow. And they were allowed, myself included, to witness what was going on. And, and there was absolutely no judgment within this. It was more of a curiosity because they were playing with timelines and they were they were going to the very core of what ran our universe and figuring out how to manipulate that. So this was a, a big, big step for humanity because nobody had actually done that on mass. We had done it individually or you know, through certain ritual to a certain degree in the past, but never to the level that we achieved using vacuum tube technology, which has its own esoteric and quantum principle. Hmm. And, you know, and you mentioned earlier, um, you know, speaking about being sensitive and the, the clairvoyance, um, you know, and, and we know that a lot of people, they have that as children and then they tend to lose that you know, as they hit puberty and, you know, become adults, do you, do you feel like did, did those, those abilities stay with you or did they leave with you, leave you as you matured? And then having said that now that uh, we're in the times that we are in now, do you feel that like maybe you're getting any more sensitivity or less sensitivity compared to before? I would have to say that it, as soon as I realized that was something I could open up to and even cultivate in a sense, uh, it, the, the gate, the floodgates just opened and they, they never shut. Uh, in fact, they keep getting wider and wider. I mean, I've had experiences, you know, in years that came later where, you know, a, a friend or a family member would pass away and they'd fucking show up, excuse my language, they would show up in front of me, either as a ball of energy that was, you know, more like an egg, some sort of oval shape, about, you know, about the size of that person too. This isn't like a small orb. Mm -hmm. And I would talk directly to them as if I was having a conversation with you right here. Uh, it was that clear and, and sentient in way of that experience. And I've always embraced it. Uh, if anything, I've sought to 
again, cultivate this when I have seen that opportunity within myself or within an opportunity that's been provided, you know, through the universe or through certain connections. I, I it's just it gets stronger and stronger every day. Now, if you don't use it, you lose it. That's the idea. But this is one of those things that once you see it, once you experience it, you're forever changed. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's it's interesting you talk about the ball of light thing. It's very common. I mean, I, I guess we're we're kind of maybe preaching to the choir here, but um, it's a shared reality. Um, I've had similar experiences where I've had um, passed on loved ones come to me and they appear to me as a ball of light. And I there's been times where I'm like confused about <laughs> who am I talking to? Who is this? And then they kind of, it kind of morphs into like a Obi-Wan Kenobi, like transparent version of them. So you can understand mm -hmm. who they are like, and yeah, that's totally, it's interesting. So, um, and I think, you know, it also makes you wonder um, when it comes to sightings of like orbs, like UFO sightings too, how, how much, how, how often maybe that's just some sort of light being or a light body. You know, could could even be like people like astral traveling, and that's what that's the physical manifestation of you seeing that. So that's just an interesting aspect to it. But yeah, it's all absolutely fascinating stuff, and um, you've definitely uh cut your cut your uh, chops a lot when it comes to the whole paranormal thing to get you ready for this Montauk documentary, which truly <laughs> is sort of like this amalgamation of everything you got the aliens and the et you got the time travel you have the satanic ritual abuse it's just like it sort of is everything or the mason the masonry the catholic church uh scientology i mean it literally all kind of wraps up all into one of this this thing and and i think something that kind of is interesting about the montauk project for, uh for me is how it really it shows you how it's all connected. You know what I mean? Like so much of this stuff is connected to this over here and this over here and this over here and this over here. And when you start making those connections, that's when like a lot of the proof starts coming out and a lot of the um, hardcore evidence starts um, really be becoming clearer and clearer. And um, I really do think that you, you may have spearheaded something with this documentary that, that you just put out because you don't you don't see as much of that in the other documentaries um that I've seen that you know there's quite a few of them um but you you really sought after evidence and I and I think that you did a good job of just kind of mixing together testimony of people who are actually there and then the real hardcore stuff where it's really hard to argue with you know I am kind of curious in your research um I remember Penny Bradley mentioning to me um a couple of years ago so i can't remember who it was that that found out this this information but Ooh. there's somebody out there who apparently made a query as to what kind of uh energy was being used at camp hero you know like how, how much power are they using how much water are they using etc cetera, etc cetera. and i'm pretty Ooh. sure that this individual found out that like on paper um whatever facility was there was using enough uh, resources to where a small city could be down there. I'm curious if you ever came across any 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 evidence like that in your research. Actually, Brian Minnick did, if you're not referring to him already. Um, he was the first to be able to garner that type of documentation because he's literally spent his entire life exploring that base. I mean, from the time he was just a kid. He was out there and he saw the trucks that were there cleaning up the toxic spills and whatever else that was chemically altering the terrain. And he was there to pick up all of the documentation that they had thrown out from wherever they had you know, pulled it up underground. And he has that documentation today. So he has the food uh, ration delivery and he has the water usage and he has the power usage from nearby uh, power plants and so forth and stations that were you know, in Montauk. Yeah, I think a lot of them are still gridded out there, but you know there were some obviously that that disappeared over time. But yeah, he he has an entire library of documentation that would talk, you know, ex explore everything that you're mentioning here. I, I like to call him the Michael Schrat 
of Montauk because he is our historian. There's nobody out there who has more information on Montauk and Camp Hero than Brian Minnick. So, so basically what we're saying, people, uh, to, to the viewers watching this, uh, if you are uh, coming upon this video because you're interested in the subject of Montauk, um, Montauk is Strange is Brian Minnick's channel, and his book is coming out soon. And you, if if you consider yourself somebody who's interested in the Montauk uh, project, uh, it's something that is a, a must purchase. This man has done a great deal of work for the Montauk project. Uh, we all, I think everybody that is a part of the subject has sort of pulled upon his research at one point or another. So it can't be understated how important his work is. And yeah, Montauk is strange. It's the channel. Mm -hmm. A lot of physical documentation on that channel because, you know, he lives nearby and he would go there and he'd find he's there's all sorts of strange stuff that he's found that's documented on that channel for people who are interested in checking that out. And he's a Can part of my screen as well. Yeah, Ar Arky, let me share my screen. Oh, 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 okay, up. I have to give you permission, don't I? Yeah, Hold yeah, yeah. Um, that's what I was doing the shaky hand cam earlier. <laughs> Um, but, okay, hold on. Just go away. I got a oh, wow permission. It's trying to make me share my screen. And and, and while while our king is setting that, Michael, um, in the week that you've released um, the uh, Lost Souls of Montauk, have uh, has, has anyone come forward and said, "Hey, I you know I was there too, um, but I have not yet you know come into the." public spotlight and I want to tell you my share my testimony or, or nothing like that yet. I get emails like that every day since I've released this. And not only that, uh, some of these people express that the information provided in the documentary and the testimony that, you know, you guys have given has given them a certain direction mm -hmm. and maybe even an answer or two within, um, some of their inquiry you know a lot of these people grew up with military families and they have missing time and they remember being in the gifted and talented program and they remember you know being taken away by xyz or people that would come for them and then some other authority would step in in front of them usually in a school setting and deny that request send them away and you know turn to the the subject and say i pretty much just saved your life and they're like what are you talking about like they were going to take you to montauk with no explanation so they had this haunting them for their entire lives and they see this documentary and they're, they're getting answers for themselves within that. So to me, that's really what I wanted to achieve with this, not only to get your voices out there and heard finally, but that it would affect others in a positive manner and allow them to see there is a path. As long as you stay courageous and straight in what you're doing, you know, it's safe to come out now. We can talk about these things freely and believe me, we are going to expound upon this in the future. So we're creating that safe space for people to feel that way and, you know, give them that internal permission that it is okay. What you went through is what you went through. You have a story, you are validated and step forward. So yes, I'll be talking to some of these people as time goes on. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, to your question, I, I get emails about that every day. Yeah. And I can testify to that as well, Brian, that I have quite a few people who contact me and tell me about being at the Montauk project and remembering me. And um, m most of these people are not going to go on YouTube and tell their story. Um, they've got lives. Um, they're respected in their communities. Um, and they don't want to, um, you know, uh, mess up their lives or make themselves look like they're crazy or something like that. And unfortunately, some of the stories that I get sent, some of the, I mean, because the documentary uh, that um, Michael put out here, it shows how gruesome it was. And unfortunately, for a lot of these people, they experienced very gruesome things um, during Montauk, and it's hard for them to find community and talk about it because of the stigma around it. So I'm really hoping that with this work that we're doing here, um, you know, together separately, you know, it's all important. Um, I'm hoping that eventually it creates a space where this is accepted as, as fact, as public fact, and just part of human history. And, um, people can get the help they need without having to feel stigmatized for it. And they can come forward with their stories and their testimony. Um, and, you know, I think that we're, we're helping create that environment 
uh, one step at a time. I know for sure that um, this stuff is a lot more mainstream and accepted than it, it right now than it was like 20, 30, 40 years ago, you know? So I think we're Maybe making five or 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I'm sure as somebody who's been doing this, because I'm fairly new with my YouTube channel, I don't even think it's two years old, but you've been doing this for a while. So you've watched the evolution of that and you've seen sort of how um, people uh, have become more open-minded and accepting of, of these paranormal phenomena, uh, including things like the Montauk project. Absolutely. And, you know, I don't see this letting up in terms of interest either. One thing that we really had working for us was uh, the, uh, is it Duffer Brothers? Duffy Brothers, I think it was, uh, releasing Stranger Things, you know, with the original working title as Montauk. And once people started understanding, even though that was, you know, more based in, you know, storytelling and fantasy, there were elements that were very directly taken or borrowed from the Montauk project uh, stories. And the brothers knew this, and that really sparked people's interest. Now, within that, I've also had to dial people back a little bit who have just a little too much enthusiasm. And, you know, for example, you know, you get guys coming from New Jersey, uh, you know, all the way down the eastern seaboard coming up to Long Island, going out to Camp Hero and trying to ghost hunt. And it's it's not look, there are many other places you can go anywhere to do that type of work, but you have to leave Camp Hero alone because the souls that are there. Well, I mean, I think, you know, what you guys had done in terms of the ritual healing did help a lot, but there's still more work to be done. The souls that are there are not your typical uh, individuals who passed on after living a full life or even had something traumatic halfway through, but still enjoy. So a lot of these were kids. So, you know, there's still this confusion within all of that energy there. And you, you can't go there opening doors and, you know, even approaching in what maybe people think is a benign way. It's actually disrespectful uh, in this particular location because of what happened there. But it, again, in the end, you know, that type of publicity did help us to garner a little more traction and a little bit more attention in respect to the mainstream uh narrative that we could now you know open up a little more freely and we would have the audience that would listen because well they saw stranger things and they're curious what true story quote unquote this was based on nice. do you do you get a, a lot of stranger things uh fans i mean because you know that's a show that was broadcast to millions and millions of people and a lot of people are excitedly awaiting season five i think it is um the the final season um, do you, do you get a lot of those people who came to it from this was a purely fictional show, and then I was such a fan, I read up about it, and then I found out it was related to this actual Montauk project, and then from there they stumble upon your content? Initially, that was the path that they followed. And I think the reason this was only initially is because eventually people were still doing their own armchair research. And by the time, you know, a year out, two years, you know, came they had time to do that research and they'd come and find me and they'd want more detail that they weren't finding, you know, doing their own research. They were already convinced. They were already convicted that, you know, this was a very large possibility in terms of a reality. And they just needed a little bit more to work with or another avenue to traverse to support and solidify that for themselves. And then in, in terms of your own journey, Michael, um, you know, a lot of people, uh, I don't know where you are in terms of wanting to recover memories, because as Arkeem was saying earlier, a lot of, you know, it's 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 soul destroying stuff for a lot of people to face sometimes. Um, have you delved into, you know, quantum uh, hypnosis and healing technique or, or other types of um, therapies to recover any potentially um, blocked memories that you may have? Nothing yet assisted. Although I can't tell you, I haven't reached out to people to do this type of work. One of the issues I come into contact with is uh, a lot of therapists. This they don't want to go. You're breaking up. Can you? Or they're can you equipped to do it, or they just have some sort of reservation. Michael, you, you broke broke up. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Could you start from the beginning there with the answer to the question? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 
What was the question? <laughs> you know, you know, Michael, you know, he answered, I heard your answer. You were saying that a lot of the, the, the issue is that a lot of the people who do oh. things like hypnosis regression yeah. therapy out there in the community at large, they're not knowledgeable about things like Montauk or secret space programs. And on the one hand, and uh, yeah, they're not, they're not necessarily equipped to deal with that. Well, one person that I yes, thank you. Drago Reed, Drago Reed, we had him on the show. Um, he's good at what he does. Um, and uh, he's equipped to handle the SSP aspect of it, but it's all this Dolores Cannon, um, QHHT, the the real deal stuff. So I really recommend him. But yeah, it's it's one it's you know it's 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 a kind of like a personal choice whether you even want to go down that path as far as recovering memories because you don't necessarily even need to do that, but it can be helpful. And and I've I've spoken to quite a few people who have found it healing and grounding. And I'm actually going to be doing a session with uh, Drago this July at the conference we have coming up. So that should be good. I would I would like to explore that um, avenue of things. I'm, I'm definitely not uh, afraid to face any of that because it is a part of ourselves. And many times those are fractured part of ourselves, parts of ourselves that that we need to recover one way or another. If we don't do it this time around. We're going to have to do it in some other incarnation. So might as well get it done while we have it in front of us within that opportunity. You know, I, I have a piece of the, the Sage Radar Tower, as I think many of us do now. And one of the, the elements I wanted to was to bring it to a clairvoyant and have them use uh, psychometry to kind of pull whatever they felt out of this piece and, and see where that aligned within what we know about the project. Well, I, wouldn't you know it? I've spoken to no less than 20 of these people all in my area, and one of two things happens. Either they don't want to touch it, or they just flat out tell me no. I was, I was at With the no same. explanation. That, nope. Nope. I, I brought a piece, a little teeny tiny piece back of the rusted radar that had fallen down, and uh, I showed it to some of my uh, housemates and business partners who they, they, they're, they're sensitives, and they said there's really sick energy on it, and then they encouraged me to throw it away. They said, don't keep it here in the house. It's not a good thing to have around. Yeah, but you know what, Brian? Because of your level of involvement, you know, we all kind of sit on uh, collective vibrational states. I mean, it might not bring any sort of detriment to you. But that being said, I think as long as other people aren't handling it, you should mm -hmm. be safe to keep that. You know, I'm very selective with who touches these pieces because mm -hmm. I, I want to cause them any sort of complication, whether they believe in that or not. I, I mean, I know what it, what it is. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think you're, you're fine as long as you kind of keep it to yourself, keep it close to your heart, you know? Mm -hmm. And Michael, when we were there all together on site during the Montauk adventure tour, um, you know, and, and I, I know you spoke to being sensitive and being able to see, say beyond the veil as it were, um, you know, like it, uh, the majority of us so far, um, you know, I, I know that Jessica, the cryptid huntress and um, uh, Long Island Bigfoot Mike, they were both able to to pick up the presence of uh, other energies, like whether they're fairy or um, Sasquatch type energy, you know, there in mm -hmm. that beautiful Montauk area. Um, did you yourself, did you sense or detect or see anything? I did. I felt the the elementals there. I didn't see specifically who it was, although I felt Sasquatch. I mean, I felt a lot of these other, um, for lack of better description, smaller entities that were there, very curious about what we were doing. Some of them knew and others just had questions, but they were all present within that effort that you guys put forward to not only heal the land itself, but, you know, the, the energies that are, you know, still there residually. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I was very focused on what you guys were doing, but I, I could always sense that. Uh, and anytime I've walked into Camp Hero, they're always there. Um, and, you know, half the time when Long Island Bigfoot comes along, they just, they, they flock to us. I mean, he, he's a magnet. Yeah, I sense that, that, that uh, both him and Jessica Jones, it was actually really important for them to be there. Mm -hmm. ritual Because they were there to help bring in the energy of the elementals and stuff like that because they helped they were there we might not be able to physically see them or whatever you know but but you could sense them and they were there and they were helping along with that process and 
they're kind of instrumental to all of this because um that fracture that's there at at Camp Hero, it that we kind of sort of started to heal. Um, it's important. It's important for a lot of reasons, and it's important to them as well. So they they it was important for them to be present, and it was important for them to be welcomed. Because unfortunately, because of some of the work that we did at Montauk, a lot of these elemental types and beings like that are afraid of us because we went against them and the natural law. And um, it was important for both Jessica and Mike to show that it was safe for them to be there and that we're transmuting and transforming that energy. And I think it's really interesting that you sensed that because that's a huge part of this, you know, is, is that there are these energies that are all around us that are important and are uh, so key to all of this. Well, I wasn't expecting them to show up. I mean, they just kind of became present and uh, my awareness shifted and I, I thought, wow, that's interesting because again I, I had no expectation in regards to you know their presence or their awareness of what we're doing but as i've thought about it since i mean it makes absolute sense even if mike and jessica weren't there you can't do anything to the land without that permission you know it, it's as if you were to come into my home and you know start rearranging stuff uh, you know you'd have to have permission to do that it's similar to even seeking healing for a land because a lot of those elementals are the land they're not separate the way that you know you and i see ourselves they yeah. are the trees they are the grass they are the soil very good so you, disclosure yeah. of this is uh the uh miyazaki studio ghibli movies i watched princess mononoke last night it is literally disclosure it's literally showing you exactly the the truth like what it's really like i live here in the redwood forest right now Okay, and Beautiful. I have the spiritual sight. It's not always turned on, but the other night I was in the forest at night, and I straight up saw the Nightwalker of the red of the Jedediah forest that I live near. Like I could see it, like, and it looked just like like Miyazaki. He must he's clued in its disclosure. Like there literally are forest spirits. There literally are elementals. It's like they they tried to kill the forest spirit, and like it you know spoiler alert, everyone at, at the end like the flowers are growing back and they're like i didn't know the forest spirit made the flowers grow and it's just like humans are so dumb who do you think <laughs> who do you think makes the flowers grow <laughs> the forest spirit you know what i mean the spirit of the forest, you know and yes these elemental beings and uh, these spiritual entities that exist all around us and we have the um the audacity as human beings to think we're the only ones and we're the important ones it's it's quite humorous almost, but it's also quite sad. But I, I'm really glad that you brought up that there are an aspect to this and that they were present is because it was very important for them to be present. And uh, Michael uh, and uh, Jessica, if you end up watching this interview, as I'm sure that you very much might, we can't thank you enough for being there. Absolutely. Yeah, and Michael, have you been back to uh, Camp Piro since uh, the the adventure tour this summer or spoken with anyone else has anyone noted any change in, in the energy there has it gotten less heavy than it was before we got there i live vicariously through brian minnick uh because he's he's always going out and you know it's a little bit of a travel for me i gotta take the ferry over and what have you so i save those jaunts for you know the warmer weather but i haven't heard anything thing uh, from him or anyone else that's really mentioned whether they felt a dip in the atmosphere or the environment but i would suspect that there was and if we were to go back we would feel something different especially in that area you know where the planetary cross grid point is and you know perhaps the surrounding areas that we affected i mean you know it's been said many times you know that these projects existed in pocket realities well, these pocket realities had some sort of physical um, element to them as well. And they were anchored by different locations, usually uh, intentionally within the Camp Hero, especially, you know, just talking about that, you know, for the localization uh, purpose of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd be really curious to, to hear um, if anyone's been back and, you know, get their feedback to see if it, it's. I've hopefully... heard the energy is clear, actually. I talked to Mike about it. Okay, good. Okay. Mike said the energy's a lot lighter there. It's a lot clearer. Okay, that's Long Island Bigfoot, Mike. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Amazing. 
And we're also going to have on the show in the near, near future. We're basically just kind of like playing it by ear because we have a couple shows, but he's going to be like two or three down the line. We're going to be talking to Mike. You know, we will go back again this year. I, I don't foresee uh, any year going forward where I won't visit Montauk down by the, um, you know, the biorhythm uh, time. So between, you know, the 10th and the 14th of August, you know, obviously the 12th being the focal point, but um, yeah, we'll be back there. I, I think James will be joining us uh, this year. I don't know who else is going to be coming, but yeah, we'll definitely be back. And there's a good chance I'll be down in uh, Orlando in July. I, I just spoke with James earlier today who gave me a lot of details about what he was doing uh, with this conference. So I may see you guys down there as well, but we'll definitely be going back to Montauk this year. It'd be having an honor. It'd be an honor to have you at the conference for sure. And you are, there's another Montauk trip kind of in the works this year. Oh, absolutely. And thank you for that. But yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, without question, we'll be going back. Now, we may not be, you know, up in lavish houses as we were before. I mean, <laughs> there have been plenty of times I've gone down there with Brian and Mike and, and we camp. Um, but it's really just a, a home base for us. And we'll do, you know, maybe interviews and so forth. So you see Brian in the movie. I mean, it took me two and a half years to put this together. So three separate trips to Montauk, uh, you're seeing the footage from uh, those times. And, you know, I put them on the picnic table and yeah, you see some cyclists in the background, but you know, it, you get the idea that this is real life and we're having a candid interview. Um, but that's generally what we use the campsite for. Of course, you know, make some good food as well. Got to build a fire. So uh, yeah, it, it, it becomes, it becomes an experience of uh, I'll put it this way, brotherhood. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in maybe coming out for that. I have a lot of uh, stuff in the works for this year. Um, I'm guessing it's going to be, is it August, September? When are you guys going to, what's that? Like down there. Um, I know some people came from, you know, very far away. Uh, and, and for those folks, I, I would understand if, you know, that travel was a little too arduous uh, for the second year in a row, but for the rest of us who are over here, you know, in the Northeast or close to, I mean, come on out. Yeah, when are you guys going to be there? Uh, probably between August 10th and August 14th. Okay, I would like to be there if I can. I know I actually live on the West Coast, but it, who knows? Maybe I could make it out there. Um, I think it's kind of important for us Montauk survivors to continuously go into the, go to that grid, tap into that energy, and um, keep on healing it. I think it's kind of doing its own thing now. Like the healing is continuous, but I still think it's healthy for us to go there and can just keep blessing that land and um, just trying to just keep it, keep it going, I guess, keep the healing moving. And it's just, yeah, it's just kind of a healing thing to revisit it. But again, as you said, you're quite a bit closer than I am. So no promises that I'll be there. But for those of you out on the East coast, there you have it. Um, another Montauk trip is in the works. So that should be interesting, interesting, and we look forward to seeing what new things you guys discover out there. Yeah, I mean, as as I mentioned, you're absolutely welcome to come along. Um, you know, I'll give you more details as we move forward. Um, you, you know, obviously things change in the most positive of ways. You know, when we're building. So, see you can do. I up. wanted to move very quickly. You're breaking up. That are still there at Camp Hero. You know, they don't show uh, You're breaking up. adults that are, are still present. Hang on. Closer to the router here. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Okay. So uh, what I was saying is, you know, it's not just the children that were lost in that etheric pocket over there in Camp Hero. There are also adults as well. Brian Minnick recently, uh, within the last like four or five months, three or four months, whatever it was, he was giving a guided tour to a couple older ladies that, you know, were interested in Camp Hero. Uh, and occasionally he will do this as a, the historian down there. And they're in the radar tower. And I think that one of the women, because you know, they brought video cameras as well, that, you know, she was panning up towards the ceiling. And as she does, you can see a, a vent shaft that's up there. and all sudden boom right into the frame comes a face as vivid as you can imagine and it looked just like preston nichols now this is curious because and al and you know even the clever one's like who's the guy in the hawaiian shirt i'm like yeah that's that's preston um 
So I know that on a higher vibrational level, they are where they need to be. Maybe this is something remnant or residual within the timelines that they explored, that there's a facet of uh, these key players still there as well. I don't know why this particular entity that was clearly caught on this video looks a lot like Preston Nichols, but there it is. Wow. I, I also heard um, James had been saying that uh, he thought that after the appearance of Junior to, to chase off the, the bad guys from uh, mm -hmm. Camp Hero, um, that they relocated to can you, can you uh, take New him Orleans. Off the screen? I, I oh, yeah. don't like looking at him. Can you please? Oh, sorry. Yeah. See you, President. So um, we uh, he's he mentioned that they may have relocated to New Orleans. Do you know anything about that? I have heard the same thing, uh, but I've also heard that they moved a part of this back to Brookhaven National Labs. I also heard that they walked uh, their way out to Colorado. The, the, the thing is, is this. I mean, within all of these deeper black projects that were mainly performed underground, they're all connected physically through tunnel systems and railway systems. And we've we've had maps to you know kind of talk about this and explore it further. Um, there's a very specific um, type of drill. I, the name is eluding me at the top of my off the top of my head that they would use to bore some of these tunnels and it was uh, atomically powered. Um, God, I can't remember the name of it. I did a whole report on it like three years ago, regardless. Um, so for them to just pick up and move, wouldn't be something that anyone would see. You know, they're not bringing helicopters to, you know, pull gear up. They're not, you know, bringing in bus loads to move people. Um, they're they're traveling underground within these systems, and they're still connected. So it's really difficult for us to now pinpoint where some of these were. I mean, if well, you look into James's documentary, my testimony, that? my testimony regarding that, I would point towards well Al Belix's testimony, where he talked about. Um, throughout the country, they built basically tentacles of the octopus, as it were, yes. that was, uh, Montauk. And he basically said it's everywhere now. It's in every city. It's a, it's everywhere. So basically, it, it, it all that Montauk was was the, was the epicenter for this thing. Um, they've got facilities all over the place. And uh, it's just expanded and it's just become a, a bigger th thing, really. And so... Um, Brookhaven National Labs is definitely a, definitely a, a facet of it and an important facet of it, but it's just one of many. 100%. Um, you know, that, that's that's the unfortunate reality. I mean, you know, as Preston expressed to James in his documentary, he thought that he entered into the project through New Jersey, which, you know, I don't know how much James can actually place that. I, I haven't really talked to him about it, but... You know, that seemed curious. And of course, we, we talk about, you know, I mean, we mentioned it too, Arkeem, in your interview, you know, somebody who's so young, 19, 20, 21, 22 years old. I mean, how are you there? Yes, time travel is a big part of that endeavor. And they were sending kids back in the early to mid 90s to Montauk, not only to witness the origins of this program, but to garner information that may have been overlooked or lost, even you know physical documentation that somebody needed for X, Y, and Z, and they would they would bring it back. So some of these kids that were indoctrinated did go back to the original time, even though it was on a, a different timeline in a sense, and then returned with the pertinent information that was requested. And now they have an experience of being in the original Montauk project. So again, it gets very convoluted when we talk about these things, but people have to keep in mind and keep an open mind that, you know, there's a lot of science out there behind time travel. You know, we know for absolute certain that it is a possibility that we can execute it as long as we have the amperage and the amplitude to provide it with enough power, you know, whatever uh, endeavor we decide the to argument, take moving backward or forward. The argument that people make is that we don't have a strong enough power source. Mm -hmm. um, and the argument that is made by me and basically my colleagues is uh, the human mind is the power source for the time travel machine we built at Montauk. And it has an exponential amount of energy that you can tap into, especially when you connect it to the the um, mind amplifying uh, chair the, or the Montauk chair, as people call it. So it's 100 percent feasible, you know, more than feasible. It's real. Yeah.
Well, that's possible, you know, but what I've understood is, you know, we have what we consider uh, or what's called a Merkaba. All right. And for those of you who are not familiar with this, it's sacred geometry within your arc field, which expands about 55 feet in all directions from the center of you. OK, this is a uh, two tetrahedrons that are upside down to each other. And the way that they are kind of angled depends on whether you are a feminine energy or masculine energy. And the purpose of this sacred geometry within your field is to tap into this allow it to spin or you actually give it the push it needs today and you can actually teleport from one place to another on the planet physically or, or you can do it within the universe that we live now it's not necessarily for traveling outside of that and it would take an enormous amount of power outside of yourself to even you know kind of consider that within the geometric makeup in the fibonacci spiral versus the golden mean infinite versus you know finite but you know, again, what they were doing in Montauk, they could have very well amplified maybe a single person's energy, maybe a group of people, where then they were then drawing off of that to help power. But from what I understand, they they were tapping into different power sources all over the country. It wasn't just in Montauk. They had ties with all these different power stations that would provide them with ample energy to at least initially get things going. Eventually, it was coming from the Eldridge uh, and, and the generators that were on that. If you remember how the, the story goes, when they collapsed the project, they actually had to go back and you know break these things up before that cyclical energy could stop. And it, the uh, project was no longer, location was no longer getting any energy from that, no electricity coming through. It's scary to think that there's a, uh, a still a possibility of a time uh, space rip in that vicinity there, uh, just north of Montauk in the water mm -hmm. where the Eldridge appeared. Absolutely. And I don't see why I wouldn't be there anymore. I don't think anybody went and fixed it. You know, there's a lot of us who are doing that type of work within our dream states. We're tasked with going into those dimensions that they created or collapsed or were artificial and were somehow writing those within some sort of spiritual work. I know that for a fact. I've talked to many people who do it as well. Um, but, you know, outside of that, I don't see anybody else making that effort to go out and sort of explore that area, that stretch of the ocean and see what they can come up with in the same way that you guys may have healed the land out by the, uh, the ley line there. I mean, we, we sent, we had a, Bob Estes and Gary Fretz charter a boat and take a crew of eight people out onto the water. And um, they, they may have gotten to do some healing work on, on the, the time rift as well. We, we've been told. Well, they well saw, you guys would have been the very first. They saw some strange things. Um, Jessica Jones talks about it a little bit. Um, she remote viewed some stuff like patterns in the water and all that stuff. And, um, they they ended up seeing some of that stuff when they went out there. So she remote viewed it before it happened. And but it, yeah, so it seems like they kind of encountered something. But again, I, I, if you were there, I'm sure you remember that there was this incredible fog that rolled in during the time where the ship was supposed to appear, which is yeah. very sus. You know what I mean? Very sus. Like, um, so who knows what happened? Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about is so I have to be frank here and admit that i did not watch the first montauk documentary you made i actually uh mm -hmm. i don't think i was even aware that you already made one and i apologize for that um i'm kind of curious what, what 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 that one kind of per per pertained to like what that was like for you and just kind of like the difference between the first doc montauk documentary you made uh and the documentary that just came out um, you know, as I, I kind of mentioned when we opened the show, it was more of a, a personal exploration for myself. So it was me going to the base, feeling intuitively and, you know, remote viewing uh, different locations and, you know, just kind of expressing what I was picking up in a right brain sense. And of course, I was interweaving some of the history and the lore that went into it. I mean, we had Peter Moon come and join us. I walked Camp Hero with him. Um, we went and visited one of the power stations because that day on the biorhythm, we did lose power throughout the entire town. And Peter had already suspected that this had something to do with what they were working on still underground in Montauk, again, with the biorhythm at the helm of that explanation. So the first one, uh, again, is really just a, an exploration into Camp Hero. It doesn't talk 
and elaborate too much on the very details of the project because, you know, at that point, the general generalities were already expressed and I didn't want to go down that route. But what I wanted to do with the second one versus the first one was to make it less about me. In fact, the second one, I mean, you see me maybe twice, once in the glass in the mirror and then, you know, once climbing up in Shadmore. And yes, I narrate some things, but it, it, the documentary has nothing to do with my personal experiences. It's all of yours. It's all of your voices. It's all of your experiences and testimony. And, you know, yes, I did the remote viewing, uh, but I had to kind of follow up on that because, I mean, it was so, so odd that I had seen these people under, you know, the earth in that remote viewing sense. And they all saw me and whoop, I went back in my body because I literally panicked. And then to come back, you know, a year later and do it again when I felt it was okay or that I was, you know, confident enough to do it. And I found the same exact room, all the lights off and nobody was there anymore. And that's when I had to get Jessica involved in a session and, and get her take on what she was picking up. So, yeah, just to answer your question, the biggest difference between the first one and the second one is that the second one is very thought out, methodically put together in respect to the players that I wanted to see on that screen and the voices that needed to be heard versus more of an exploration within Camp Hero and the lore and hanging out with Peter Moon which was the focus of the first one. What was it like kind of meeting all these different survivors and, and seeing everybody talk with one another and just being a part of that energy? Um, what was that like for you? I know it was definitely really intense for me. Um, how, what, 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 how did you feel like? What was it I like? thought it was, well, I thought it was very communal. Um, as you mentioned, Arkeem, at one point, you, you said, well, I thought it was going to be darker, you know, this visit. And it's not. It was more about light. It was more about the healing. I think each one of us had that intention, and that's what we brought with us. So for me, it was uh, sort of an explosion of energy when we all got together. And it was a celebratory sort of uh, experience for me, wherein maybe there was reuniting within energies and maybe consciously, maybe subconsciously. People were recognizing each other. They were allowing each other to share these experiences. We were really working with healing all the way around. I mean, I was doing Reiki sessions for people up to the very moment I had to leave. I mean, the very minute I caught that ferry. Now, mind you, we're two and a half hours away with traffic. By two minutes, I got that ticket and I got on the boat. I was, it was They were literally pulling off. But up to that point, that's you know that was all that was about was the healing and the community and getting to know each other, knowing what we had been through, and then exploring other, you know, avenues within ourselves and conversations that, you know, lend it to that healing. Once again, lent rather is the word. <laughs> it sounds like we've got another blind target or, or target for Jessica to then mix in with all these other targets so that she can hit it blindly. Um, you, you said that, that you do um, remote viewing as well, Michael. Have you thought about uh, trying to revisit the site and what's under there? I think Colin, uh, after we did our, our healing ceremony there, he, he said that he, he had the impression of a, in an underground facility underneath that barracks area, that circle where, where we were at, of uh, some kind of red crystal or crystal technology being kicked over. Yeah, I mean, and, and uh, Jessica mentioned something very similar in respect to there being crystalline structures down there, large crystals, copper wiring, uh, everything it seems that you would need to make some sort of generator in what we might consider the most esoteric sense. I mean, this is more simple science rather than, you know, getting moving parts and levers and so forth. You know, this is ancient knowledge that they had eventually garnered and somehow uh, applied. Really, it became a practical application rather than just the knowledge. So I probably will remote view that spot again. Um with some reservation considering what i've already found but when i went back to do it the second time i was expecting to maybe see something different or see people there and it just i mean i can't describe it other than to say that when i when i finally saw that there was nobody there and it was still the same room i was shocked it, it was definitely something outside of myself and and within those type of experiences that's how i can validate that I'm not actually influencing what I'm seeing when it comes to a remote viewing session, because things will not be any way, shape or form the way that I expected. And if it is, there are always distinct differences that I couldn't have thought of that I'm picking up during that session. So yes, eventually I probably will do that once again. Well, not only is, 
is Jessica going to be at the conference? Uh, we're also going to have Courtney Brown of the Farsight Institute. So, remote you know, from- G. Yeah, the remote viewing. <laughs> <video. laughs> He's like the master of remote viewing, right? Like, I'm actually extremely grateful and honored that he's going to be the keynote speaker for this conference i don't think we could pick a better person because he's very empirical and he speaks very clearly and fluently and um matter of factly and kind of almost scientifically with the way it prevents it presents his information and that's exactly what we need and to anyone who is not clued into farsight institute and courtney brown you need to be I would love to see Joe McMonagle be there as well. That would be, that would be a trip. Honestly, I'm not familiar with uh, with that individual. I'll have to look into them. He uh, he was one of the original remote viewers for the CIA, oh, and that's... he's yeah he was up there with everyone that ended up getting knocked off, uh, for lack of better terminology here, YouTube friendly, um, and, and it's been traced back you know, to the actual assassin who was from Russia, who was, you know, assigned to do this. Um, he evaded that somehow. He didn't fall under that umbrella, but he's remote viewed Mount Hayes out in um, Alaska. And he's seen the same facilities that the the gentleman before him, I forget his name, uh, who Price. didn't survive. Yeah, what Pat was it? Price. Pat Price, Thank who you. sounds like he was assassinated either by yes. the Ruskies or our own people trying to cover up the secret space program stuff at Mount Hayes. From what I understand, it was ordered from us to, you know, an assassin who was Russian, who then took him in uh, Las Vegas, I think it was. And it was by just a a quick pinprick to the knee uh, or to the leg. And, you know, this guy barely even realized it, but he was done the next morning. And then when he was questioned later, this, this assassin, he outright says, yes, I don't know if it was exactly that guy, but I was assigned to do that in Las Vegas. And we just put the, you know, the dots together here and we know exactly what it is. But yeah, Joe is a, is a is a veteran when it comes to remote viewing, um, and and his story is incredibly vast. So if uh, Arkeem, you're not familiar with him, I definitely encourage you to check him out. I do have him in my circle of, of friends here somewhere. Um, I just I haven't spoken to him um, personally yet, but I I certainly do have the opportunity to do that at some point. Interview opportunity. Are, are you heard it here first, guys? Right, Arkeem? <laughs> you bet. Yeah, no, thanks for cluing us into him. We're definitely uh, somebody that we need to research a bit more on. And yeah, great. Um, Absolutely, man. Yeah, well, it's it's been really great um, going down memory lane here with this. This was this it was a great trip that we went on when we did this. Um, there was like a lot of camaraderie and uh, just uh, healing. That was what really sold me on it. Is um, I got asked by James to be a part of this and kind of be one of the figureheads of it because i was there like he kind of thought i should be there which i was honored that he felt that way and my first response was mm-hmm. like the trauma of it i don't know if i want to go into that darkness and he's like it's going to be healing we're going to be healing and he was more honest words haven't been spoken because that's 100 percent what it was and i guess i could say i, I recommend to other montauk survivors uh who maybe want some closure other people who have been there um you know, uh, Michael has this other trip that is going to be going on in the future. And I think it's a good thing for Montauk survivors to do, to go there as a free person and sort of get that closure. And um, I'll be honest. With, oh, sorry. No, that's fine. That's what I had to ask. Basically, that was it. Yeah. I was going to say, it was really important uh, for me in this initial vision for the second documentary to make it, it about the healing process, because we're all familiar with the trauma that went on there, you know, some more than others, but we all understand, we think about the Montauk project, we think about the horrors and the terrifying experiences that people had to endure. And we're familiar with that. So once we get to that point, what what do we do, right? Where's the next step? Do we just sit in awe and, you know, gape at this sort of thing that had happened? Or do we look further and to see what comes next? The healing is what comes next. And the beautiful thing about this, according to Duncan, is that it was by 2020 at, at the latest, that the certain cyclical biorhythms were met and the requirements for that healing or interact um, interconnectivity within the energies would allow us to break free from that energy that was holding on to us in a very uh, morose and sorrowful sense 
we have to go through that grief, of course. But once you're done with that, the next step is to get on that horse again and become that stronger person and heal. So for me, that was the most important aspect. And even initially, when I first started filming for this, uh, you know, just garnering a bunch of B-roll, didn't have the overall vision, I knew that it had to be about healing. And that's why it took me as long as it did to put this out, because I needed to have the right people who were on that path. And that was all of you to be a part of this, to relay that this is what comes next. And we don't have to just sit in the trauma like a lot of the first generation did. Yeah. I mean, you, you definitely moved beyond it, Michael. You've got 213 videos here on your channel. It's, it's, you've got a, you've got quite a portfolio here of work. Now, thank you, brother. We've been busy. Been busy. <laughs> and we're only, we're only starting, man. This is, this is just the beginning of a much larger movement that will continue to gain momentum as we go forward, especially when we talk about Montauk. Yeah, you're doing, you're doing great work over there at uh, Dark Hour Paranormal, and we all appreciate it. Um, is there anything else that you want to maybe like talk about? Anything you got cooking up for the future um, that you maybe want to get people clued in on or, or anything like that before we wrap things up? Hey, thanks for asking. Uh, I do have one thing. Um, I'm working with Mike Colantonio, Long Island Bigfoot, on a documentary about his ways of going about connecting with these elementals. I think that's really at the core. It's his story. Um, and I'd like to see that come out around the beginning of the summertime so keep your eye out for that it's going to be a very compelling documentary uh i've already sat him down we went to new york together spent a few days in, in a house that was out there and just did the work and did the interviews and you know asking the right questions and getting to know his methodology when it comes to contacting not only bigfoot but the elementals at large uh, i think mike is really on to something very unique in respect to that. And I wanted to highlight that as something that not many other people are doing. So again, that should be out in the beginning of the summer, uh, if I'm lucky. <laughs> yeah, Mike is a great guy. So we, we look forward to that. Oh, yeah, my friend. I'm sure you guys uh, form quite the dynamic duo working together. I'm sure it's going to be kick ass. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's the three of us, man. It's myself, Michael and Brian. Like that's oh, where it okay. started. Well, hey, the yep. three musketeers, man. <laughs> that's gonna be great. <laughs> that's gonna be great. All right, we're looking forward to that. Um, well, I think you know we kind of covered all the ground we really need to. Um, like I said to to everybody who's tuned in, get get over to Dark Hour Paranormal, give them a uh, subscribe, check out his content, and watch this Montauk documentary. Um, and uh, yeah, um, thanks everyone for being here for watching the show. We. We all really appreciate you, um, our viewers, for caring about this information and keeping up with it. We think it's important, and we're glad that you do, too. Um, and, yeah, have a good night, everyone, or good day, or whenever you're watching this. <laughs> Thank you so much, boys. Here. That's right. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Arkeem. Time to